Ahead of the big coronation in May, King Charles is reportedly in talks to give his very own tell-all interview, with speculation that he could share his side of the story on that big fallout with his son Prince Harry. Well, Royal editor Russell Myers joins me now. So, what mm. do you think? Well, fascinating, yeah. firstly. I mean, if this uh, does come to fruition, not only be very uh, uh, some very pleased BBC bosses, I imagine, because this uh, tell-all interview, as it's been labelled, would be quite Explosive. I think in the first instance, there definitely is an appetite for Charles to perhaps uh, be interviewed, talking about his uh, his life plans, his legacy that he wants yeah. to shape out ahead of the coronation. Mm. But of course, nobody could get away with uh, not asking him about the scandal and infighting with his own family. Of course, we've had the Prince Andrew saga that has rumbled on for for many years now, and of yeah. course the, the the Harry and Meghan issues that uh, have been played out so spectacularly over the last few weeks, especially. So um, your I guess is as good as mine. Jonathan Dimbleby possibly being lined up for the yes. interview. That would of, make sense. It would make sense. Because he's yeah. wrote the book. But can I just say, yeah. King Charles, if you're watching, <laughs> and I know you are, <laughs> please don't. Just don't. Don't do it. It could make things a home. If it, I was advising yes. him, I would well, say... You are. You are I'm now. advising yes, him. Yeah. I'm advising you. <laughs> I'm sure he's so happy about that. Please, please, please don't. I like, think, I, you know... I, no, I take the high ground. The issue don't. with this is, I mean, of course we all would want to hear from him. I think he yeah. gave that eloquent speech. No. Just uh, when he was taking over the top job, as it were, talking about unity, mm -hmm, togetherness. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he'd want to convey those sorts of messages. However, it's all getting a bit soap poppery with it. It is, the, and the you know fine well he could go on and do that interview with mm -hmm. Jonathan Dimbleby, and it could be 99% all about his good works and what he's planning yeah. and all the rest of it and everything that he wants to do. And then there would be one question about Prince Harry, and that would dominate Which the we whole all want to know, thing. Of course. That would dominate the whole thing. So no, do not do it. <laughs> Step away from the situation, Your Majesty. Unless we get him on the sofa ourselves. Oh, he's got an open invite. Yes, you know that, so. he's got an open invite. Now, look, he does, you know, still sticking with King Charles, he definitely wants Harry at the coronation, mm. absolutely. And again, I think that's that's right. You it should. Is. And then it's up to them. Exactly. If, if Harry and Meghan want yeah. to come, fine. Well, it's, if all, they don't, it's all about, I mean, coming back to this issue of talking about unity, togetherness, yeah. and he said that in his, uh, in his maiden speech to the nation, indeed the world, uh, when taking over. But, um, of course, I don't think he'll be as petty to sort of strip them uh, the invitation away from no, Harry and Meghan. Harry has left the door open mm -hmm. as well in the several interviews he gave uh, published, published as his long as his book. family apologise, yes. he says. Yeah, so there are some sort of caveats involved. Yeah. But interestingly enough, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has apparently got involved and been Good. asked to become sort of a, a conduit, a peacemaker. We said that last week, we didn't did, we? Yeah, we yeah. said, call on the superstar, yeah. the superhero. Buy, buy lottery tickets He's this got weekend. The, cake. Because, uh, yeah. the Archbishop of Canterbury <laughs> yeah. can just breeze in and hopefully, hopefully sort it out. There has to be conditions on both sides. You would think mm. that they would say to Harry and Meghan, do not bring a Netflix crew, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, you would Just, imagine that's got to be yeah. high up on the agenda. Speaking of Megan, Megan's been very quiet. She has. I thought she'd be with him a lot. With Harry well, Wallace, you know what? She's just... Take yeah. herself out She has taken a back seat. Yeah. I mean, there's a, you know, several reports saying that uh, perhaps she didn't know which way the wind would blow with Harry's book, whether it would be a success or not, and what sort of reaction he would get. However, I'll play devil's advocate here because I think she was sort of allowing him Absolutely. to take the spotlight for yeah. good or for worse. And indeed, he has taken the spotlight because we haven't... Uh, we've had no-ending stream no. of stories and interviews that he's been giving. But they are back to work in a, 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 in a few weeks. And um, listen, what, who knows what happened? Happen. Maybe they will sort of take a take a peaceful road for the next few months before the coronation. But yeah, think. do you believe it? No, no I probably I don't. don't. No. And joining me now, Kate Silverton and Giovanna Fletcher, two of the campaign's champions who've been working very, very closely with the princess. And I know, Kate, you were hosting the event last night. Um, it is a passion project. Um, and she's been doing this. This is not overnight. She's doing this for a long no, time. a long, long time. More than 10 years now. Right. And her passion is rooted in the science and in bringing what was really lovely last night was this collection for the first time of psychiatrists, neuroscientists, psychotherapists, as well as lots of wonderful celebrities. And in one room, and that's what she's done, is brought everyone together because it's such an important message. She's got that star power. What is the whole point of this? What, what difference will it make? What does she hope that it will achieve? Big difference, hopefully. The science has been there for 
probably 100 years, scientists uh, speak in wonderfully long sentences <laughs> with big words like cerebellum and hippocampus and what have you. <laughs> and so when you're a bit nerdy, like me, and dare I say, uh, the princess, when you dive into it and you look at it as a mother, and I've been researching this alongside and working with a lot of these charities and um, specialists for a very long time because that's my passion as well. But when you dive into it and you think, well, hang on a moment. We all need to know this. When yeah. I first became a mum and my military husband walked in at six weeks in saying, oh, my God, why does no one tell you it's going to be this hard? And <laughs> getting my green beret was easier than this. <laughs> and you kind of go, it should be, you know, why do we not know this stuff? So when, when you discover the information that we, that we have, you think, I can't now not know this right. and the passion then becomes about sharing it and that's exactly what the princess wants to do. So if there was one thing that you could say to new parents, what, what should they learn from all of the research that's been done, that's been done over the past 10 years by this process? Yeah, is that our babies don't just arrive in our laps uh, beautifully fully formed. Uh, the brain starts developing post a few weeks post conception. So what we experience in the room, in the womb, is experienced by the brain. And in the first year of life, our baby's brains literally double in size. So it's a crucial time because lots of these lovely neural connections are being made and all these sort of um, associations about what the world is. Is it a safe place? Am I going to be looked after if I cry? All of these things. And that's all going on in the first few years of life. Right. So, look, in the main, we parents are doing an amazing job, right? And everything we do with our smiles, with every our hugs and the proximity and the... the, the the care that we give for our children is brilliant. Yeah. But I think when we understand the science, when it's made simple, which is what we're trying to do with this campaign and accessible, we might start thinking, ah, right, so instead of that being a toddler tantrum, maybe my child is in the middle of, of something bigger that I can now help them with. Because I think in the past, we've sort of seen children as naughty and dismissed them as yes. being and naughty. And you say your book, There's No Such Thing as Naughty. That's yes, your, that's your book. That's why it? I wrote that because again, it was as soon as I learned this, it made my parenting so much easier because I could look at my children and think, right, even if I'm in the supermarket and there's a huge and meltdown going stuff. and I'm embarrassed and everything, yeah. I can actually think, hang on a moment, it's not about the cornflakes, something else is going on. And I can be curious then as a parent, not embarrassed or mm -hmm. thinking I'm doing a bad job, but thinking, what's going on for you right now that I need to help you with? Outrageous, please welcome Mr. Mark Gatiss. Yay! <laughs> yeah, I've never had too much fuss in my life. <laughs> it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. And shut that door, <laughs> yes. as we will see. You can say it. Oh, I can say it. It's so good to see you. And I loved this because it was such a huge part of my childhood crossroads. It was always on you were doing your homework or having your tea. And you know what's lovely? You've given No Gordon her place. Because she was kind of forgotten about, wasn't she? Yeah, I mean, it's I, I remember it so vividly oh, from my childhood too. too. But but um, I'm, I'm very touched by the fact that ITV has made this big three-parter about one of their least celebrated things, That's which is true. Crossroads. But Noel Gordon was an incredible woman. I mean, a, a pioneering TV producer, the first woman on colour television. I didn't know that. No, no nobody Until did. Until I saw the uh, drama. John Logie Baird, I mean, literally, it's incredible. John Logie Baird yeah. invented telly, yeah. actually put her on. She was the first... Yeah. Ah, oh, the first colour TV. And the first woman to interview a Prime Minister. Absolutely. I mean, she yeah. was. She really was a trailblazer. And best friends with Larry Grayson. What more could you want? with Larry Grayson. <laughs> that double act is just terrific. And in, in a way, a lot of people have forgotten him too. And yeah. he was a massive yeah. star. Well, I've, I found uh, one of the joys of, of being offered this job was, uh, was rediscovering him, really. Yeah. And remembering how much he was a part of our, our oh, childhoods. But absolutely. also... He's just so funny. It's, it's so wonderful. It's, it's sort of filthy stuff, <laughs> but it it's was. kind of it's delivered with such innocence. Yes. And he was just an absolute natural. You know, he went straight from the clubs after. It's like a thirty-year overnight success story. Yes, he was an overnight success after yeah. three yeah. decades of hard graft. Yeah. But then, you know, as soon as he's in a TV studio, he just knows how to go. And just and just looks to a camera and gets a laugh. And you gets know, a it's laugh. That thing. is. Yeah such a brilliant skill <laughs> it really is and the fact i just think that Noel gordon and larry grayson would absolutely have loved this whole thing well how could just, they not <laughs> i mean they just would have and to be played by helena bonham carter yeah. of course and you do most of your scenes all of your scenes yeah. actually must yes. have been with yeah. helena yeah. mustn't they yes well you know, it was a, it was one of those 
jobs you you hope you'll you'll get offered and uh, yes. obviously R russell t davis's uh, great script and and helena who i I've, I've met a couple of times over the years and never worked with yeah but it was very strange the first our first day on set was on this is your life uh Noel's this is your life uh reproduced beautifully and uh and i said you know it's an odd moment for this because i, I had a poster of helena on my my wall we're almost exactly the same age but when i was a student i had a poster for a room with a view I said, it's very odd now that this has finally come full yeah. circle. For it us, is, you know. it's strange, isn't it? And, he, and of course, Larry Grayson was in Crossroads as well. Did he not play the chauffeur well, it's when a she lot, was getting married? He, he, is, he does a guest spot which doesn't exist anymore, so there's some photographs. Oh. And then on the famous wedding day at yes. Birmingham Cathedral, um, the, pu the publicity shots are him. Uh, in, a, in a ridiculous white chauffeur's, <laughs> there we are. There she, uh, and there the he room. is, yes. oh, that look. <laughs> but I don't, think, I don't think it ever actually made it into the show. It's become a slightly an urban legend. Oh, OK, yeah. well, it should have. <laughs> it absolutely should have. It's such a good drama. I just, I wallowed in nostalgia, but also I think the people that don't know Crossroads or don't remember Crossroads will get a lot from this as yeah. well, I don't think, you think? I, I keep saying it's, it's a great it's, story. It's, it's the story of a queen losing her crown. Totally. And if you know nothing about daytime soaps or or the history of British mm. television, you, you still get it. She's oh. she's this extraordinary matriarch who is so, has the carpet whipped from under her and and doesn't know what to do with herself. But she she comes back amazingly to do gypsy. There she's doing. Yes. There she's doing the, the bye bye on the QE too. This is the funniest thing. I did an interview <laughs> recently about this, and the, the interviewer had only seen a rough cut where Helena was on a sort of scissor lift because, of course, they put her into the footage of the QE2. Sure. And he thought that's what Crossroads had done. <laughs> and Russell said, no, they had the QE2. I mean, literally, the, QE2? the only time they ever... Scarlett was there too. There's a new leading lady taking over the West End and I've got exclusive backstage access to meet her and the cast of 222 ahead of their press night. Let's go and check it out. Now, I know for you, Cheryl, this is your West End debut. Yeah. Did you feel there was maybe pressure on you to potentially do a musical, first of all, because obviously everybody knows you for your music background? I think probably people's, con you know, misconception was that that's what I would go into if I was going to go into theatre. Yeah. But for me, I love watching musicals, mm -hmm. not so much participating in them. Oh. So when I came to see the play, because I saw it before I said I would join, um, I was actually just blown away with how much I loved it and wanted really? to take part in it, yeah. There was a weird familiarity in it, and I wonder if it's the right as a Jodie. Ah. Mm. I wonder if that does have something to do with it, but I don't know. I, I was watching it and thinking, I would love to play that role. Yeah. I just could feel that it would be a right fit. I mean, there's lots of swearing and shouting, which helps. <laughs> 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 but no, it just felt fun. Yeah. yeah. You got a call a week before preview started, yeah. which is a week before press night, mm -hmm. um, to come back in. Obviously, unfortunately, yeah. Hugo Chegwin was ill and couldn't play the role. Yeah. How was that for you? It's been uh, an emotional week. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, yeah, so I think we had th uh, four, three days rehearsal and then I was back on stage. Obviously mm -hmm. did it with Lily Allen a year and a half ago and she did an amazing job. And now to get the opportunity to do it, this amazing cast and Cheryl, um, uh, who's incredible, who's re is really good. So uh, yeah, so exciting for me to, to see her doing the, doing the show and, and hopefully for the audience as well. I think they're gonna be really excited. Cheryl and I both found Jake quite intimidated on the first no. day because he was so good. Yeah, we, we, we we, we said. Oh, that's good. We felt a bit, felt a bit, I've paid her know. to say all that. <laughs> I was going to say, did you know that, Jay? <laughs> yes, because you paid her. Yeah. <laughs> the show isn't just about scary ghost stories. There's a lot more to it, and there's a lot of comedic moments, aren't yeah. there? It's hilarious. Is it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny. yeah, so yeah. Funny. Like, there's a danger of us finding it like funny in the moments we shouldn't do. So yeah, what happens if you corpse on stage? Oh, I, I did. Happened, I, I did. <laughs> 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 oh, no. no, and did I didn't even know that was a thing, Jake joined later on yes so it, i think it was the second show with him and he has such comedic timing and such a different and way energy. like he it's hard to hide from honestly how bold and funny he's been it's a pretty serious moment where i'm supposed to respond to one of his questions and i just could feel the bubbling it was bubbling hmm. and bubbling and i tried to look away and i just it, it just came out 
And then I couldn't stop. The director was like, you get one of those, <laughs> you're corpsed. And I said, corpsed? I was like, corpsed? <laughs> but it's out of the way now. Yeah. Right. All done in previews. It is going to be, obviously, a huge show, a great run. The girls, Girls Allowed Girls, they've all done stage plays. Will you be yeah. expecting to see them throughout your run? Yes, definitely. Yeah. You're looking yeah. forward to that? I, that I don't like. Oh. It's an emotional thing. Because we've had so many emotional moments together, I know how they'll be feeling and thinking. Mm. And before a show, I can't handle that. OK. The emotion of, like, them being proud and them being, like, I know you're going to be... I don't want to hear from them until after the show. Well, the Cheryl fans who are very present in the first few rows especially and, and you feel their love for mm. Cheryl and for the show and, and that's lovely. It's, yeah. yeah, it's really good fun. It's a different experience. Yeah, I can imagine. To any other play I've done. So, Cheryl, in the programme you are Cheryl, which means that you have joined the likes of Madonna, oh. Brittany, oh. Elton. You are officially a mononym. Oh. How does that make you feel? Oh, I'll take it. Yeah. I mean, good company. Yeah, good company. <laughs> you are indeed. The, the, I, I had no idea that was on there until I saw the 222 poster um, yeah. outside the front of the Lyric Theatre, but I, I will happily and gladly... Now, his books are loved by children all over the world. His most popular story, I guess, is we're going on a bear hunt. Over 12 million copies that's, that's sold and counting. Now, author Michael Rosen is writing about his own life, sharing lots of tragedies, the tragic death of his son, and, of course, his battle with COVID. Michael, it's so good to see you. And this book, I love how you've done it, Getting Better, and it says life lessons on going under, getting over it, and getting through it, which, of course, is the story that everybody loves. What a remarkable story it is. Oh, thanks very much. It Actually, is. it says Michael Rosen getting better, yes, doesn't it? Which it is does. It sort does. of a joke. Yeah. Well, you have got better. I mean, was it the fact that you had COVID and, I mean, for goodness sake, you're at death's door? Um, was it that that made you want to write this book? Yes. I mean, I, was, I, I wrote the book about uh, getting COVID, many different kinds of love, and then off the yes. back of it, thinking about the fact that I was, it was a brush with death, yeah. thinking about other things that had happened in my life, talking about it with the publishers, and that's how the book emerged. Yeah. Sometimes books do. One book gives birth to another book. Yes. Is, is that appropriate? Anyway, no, I think it is. Yeah. I, I completely understand what you're saying. I mean, the thing about this is there's so much loss in here, but there's also hope. I mean, you're a brilliant storyteller, of course you are, but you do talk about your son who died, your, your Eddie, and that was, what, 1999? He yes, died of meningitis, right. and he yes. was so young. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it was the septicemia version of meningitis, so it's mm -hmm. where the bacterium goes into the blood, and right. that's the really lethal, quick version of it, mm -hmm. if I can be precise about it. Yeah. But you, was this the first time that you felt you could write about it? You could sort of... And, and I would imagine that would be very difficult um, to do that. I had spoken about yes. it and had written poems about it, but I'd never put it all in a line. I mean, it's, it's a bit hard to describe, but put it all in one narrative that yeah. said... This is what happened the day that it, you know, he, he didn't, he was at home and so on. So telling it is a story and then that, if you lay it all out like that, then it, it sort of helps you to then think about what you feel. It's right. quite hard to describe, but if you tell the story first, then you can say how you feel. Right. No, I, I completely understand that. And, it, and he was, like I say, so young, only 18. Only 18. It's just, it's, it's very, very difficult. But again, this book... You do say getting over it and getting through it, and you have somehow. You know, but it's interesting you say that time, for you, time wasn't a healer. It's, it's that thing, isn't it? Everybody deals with grief in a different way. Yes. I mean, with Eddie, I think the first thing I had to do was to find out about meningitis. This right. may seem quite strange, but I wanted to know that it wasn't some strange, weird thing that had taken him away or that it wasn't some kind of punishment of me. I wanted to find out what is yeah. this thing because mm -hmm. literally I put him to bed or put, he went to bed a little bit ill, gave him some paracetamol and then he was dead in the morning. I mean, it was that quick, which is the way septicemia mm -hmm. can work. Um, and I wanted to find out how, can, how is that possible? Yeah. And uh, so I talked to doctors, I went online, and that, that was a great help to me. Yeah, I can, I can understand that that would be because you, you have to find out why, and what could I have done? And, of course, you couldn't have done anything. Yeah, well, e no even doctors have missed it in, in our no. time, we know, no. because to start off with, it looks like flu, you know. Yeah. And, you're... and if the rash isn't visible, yeah. um, you know, it can just be in the armpits or in the groin, 
um, and they don't always say that, um, but it can be, so you don't actually see it. Right. I think anyone reading this is actually going to, to know what to look out for as well, which, yeah. again, yeah. is so there's so many different layers to this book. There's also something that you say, which I think there's not enough of in the world, and you love playing, you know, kids playing, um, silliness, all of that. And it's amazing that that, you know, in conjunction with all the, the, the tragedy that's in here, is also that, like I said, that hopefulness... Yes, it's well, it, it's one way of looking at silliness, having fun, laughing and so on, is that if you sort of see um, the sad stuff over here and the silly, funny, happy stuff there, that the more of that, it's pushing that away. Yes, now, yes. you don't want to bury it because you've got to deal with it. Uh -huh. You know, it's problematic. But at the same time, you know, if it, that's totally dominating, then your life, you're, you're ground down by it. Mm. You know, I talk about seeing a woman in a cemetery in Paris um, and uh, I went up to her and said, why, why are you crying? She was standing next to the grave. I could see it was of her son. And she said, my son died in a car accident. And I said, when? And she said, 10 years ago. And she was in pieces. And I remember thinking, I hope I'm not as so overwhelmed by Eddie's death in yeah. 10 years' time, as I am now. I said, this mm. was you know, at just shortly after he had died. And I remember thinking that then. And so there's this idea that, I have that if you if you can make yourself happy, then it pushes that other stuff away. So yeah. it's like a sort of concertina, you know, when the the folds in the concertina yeah, yeah. push up and so on. So yeah. no, no, no. Again, that is that's you can see that, and, and it's because you're so good a storyteller, you can actually visualise that yeah. happening. And um, because you're like the way you are, and you can see things the way that you do, I think that's what makes you such a brilliant storyteller and writer for kids. Because kids yeah. can really, you know, they get it. Because children are clever. Well, you know? I've started telling them now, because I was in the coma for 40 days and 40 nights, it's now gone into my act when I'm with kids. Right. And I say, do you know, in 2020, um, the doctors put me to sleep. How long do you think I was asleep for? Right. And they say one day, two days. And I say, well, it was 40 days and 40 nights. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> and then we have a little fun, and some people say Jesus, and some people say Noah, and then I pick up on the Noah thing, and I go, hmm... But I didn't have a boat. Ah. Um, and I, and uh, is Noah in the, the boat with anybody else? And they all say, the animals. And I say, anyone else? And they go, yeah, Mrs. Noah. And I go, well, I wasn't with Mrs. Noah. Oh. My wife wasn't allowed to come in, though she did come in to wake me up. Because that's what she did, you see, because I wouldn't wake up. Mm. They took me off the sedation and um, they wouldn't wake me up. So I tell them in very child terms that my wife came in, held my hand, played me recordings of my children in my ear, yeah. on the phone, and apparently I waved my arm about. I'm imitating her, imitating me now. <laughs> I waved my arm about when I heard my son say to me something. I don't know what it was. Hi, Dad. What do, what do, what do teenage boys say? Anyway, yeah. something like that. And um, that woke me up. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, they were getting worried that I wouldn't. Well, listen, keep doing what you're doing, for goodness sake. Never retire. And Michael Rosen Getting Better is out right now and I love its life lessons on going under, getting over it and getting through it. Thank you. Thank you Lorraine. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. And I love your mugs. You take that away with you? Do I? Absolutely.